Did you see that a guy got arrested in Houston today uh, because a tiger was loose in a suburb? A tiger in a suburb? <laughs> I'm being serious. You make it sound like I'm joking. I'm being serious. He got arrested because he let loose a tiger. I'm pretty sure it was his tiger. Damn. And I think he was already on the run from the police. There was already a warrant out for him. They couldn't get him. And they found him because he was chasing after a loose tiger. That's wild. I I looked on a Joe Rogan podcast. They were talking about how many people have, like, dangerous animals just as pets in America. It's insane. And it's a lot. There are a lot of them. That's frightening. Yeah. When you consider how much easier it would be in America to just let the animals loose and never see them again. Yeah. There's so much space. There is, but I suppose for like a tiger. Maybe dangerous? There are quite all dangerous animals anyway, though. Maybe there's bears. Maybe a tiger would upset things. I mean, probably. (laughs) (laughs) It's just a loose tiger. I'd imagine that would cause some issues. So why did you loose it one mile outside of Houston? Well, that'd be far enough. No! (laughs) It's like, it was funny when we were talking to Granny about being in the wildlife park and uh, we were saying that we saw the tiger. And she says, oh yeah, you know, you're fine if you don't, or was it mum? So yeah, they won't get you if you don't turn around. And she said it like a complete expert and like she'd been dealing with tigers all her life. Oh yeah. It might be your Granny. Like, full <laughs> eye contact's what you need. And then they're like, if you make full eye contact with them, they just back off. And I have no idea where she got that information. I have, I don't know. Yeah, but I'm not... We're not in there with the tiger. <laughs> the tiger's not loose, cracking around. That was strange, wasn't it? I love my granny. She comes out with some bellers like that sometimes. She does. She does. Well, it's time. Welcome to the Generally Spooky Podcast. Dun, dun. I've forgotten how our music goes. That's because when you sang it last time, you made it sound like Jurassic Park. No, you just misheard. It sounded like Jurassic Park. Why don't you, the listener, decide? <laughs> what did you think? <laughs> We should just keep that in as is and now play the intro music. did you think (laughs) wasn't that a wonderful piece of music (laughs) oh we should say if you did enjoy our intro music it was written and recorded by our friend who goes by celestial fury and he he's an amazingly talented musician i don't think i can put into words how amazing and talented he actually is uh he takes commissions he works with lots of people, if you're interested in that kind of thing. And he just started an Instagram account, which is at Celestial Fury underscore music. He's also my guitar teacher. Yes. And our longtime friend. Yeah. You've known him since you were 11. Yes. And I've known him since I was 15. Yes. For our sins. Yes. So please give him a follow. Go see what he's about. He has a YouTube channel called Celestial Fury. So please yep. go check him out and follow him. And you see him on Spotify. Yeah. You should also follow our Instagram, if you don't already. Yes, Generally Spooky on Instagram. Yep. And if you're listening and enjoying, rate, review, subscribe, all the good things on your podcast player. I mean, presumably if you're listening to this, you're already subscribed. (laughs) Reviews help big time. The Instagram is where I'll keep you up to date on how things are going between seasons, like release dates and little sneak peeks and all that fun stuff. That'll be on the Instagram page. So Instagram page, Instagram account. God, you're so behind the times, Grandpa. <laughs> I know, I know. So follow us there if you're interested in keeping up with all that kind of stuff. On that there Instagrams. <laughs> Shut up. You don't do the Instagram. I don't do the Instagram. I have no idea. I do the website, which is generally spooky. <laughs> I know, know that now. <laughs> <laughs> Both burned you at the same time. Simultaneous couple burn. <laughs> so this is episode... Eight. Seven. We're on episode seven. And I know nothing about this week. 
at I all. thought you got a sneak peek at the title. I was on your Google Drive for something else. I wasn't just sneaking. Yeah, Kieran likes to snoop through all of my personal documents. <laughs> <laughs> just to check for any funny business. Mm-hmm. I saw the black. That's okay. all I saw. Okay. Well, I've really been looking forward to today's story. I am pretty pumped. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I am pretty pumped because for the first time in generally spooky history, all seven episodes, we finally have an honest to goodness ghost story. <gasps> A spooky ghost story. Oh, shit. Oh. It's finally happening. It's happening. We had some tangent ghosts in the Glam's Castle episode. Yeah. Like, that was because I feel like. Ghost adjacent. Yeah, the Glam's episode was all about the castle, so there was lots of different stories. This is a ghost story, and I love it. Hell yeah. Today we're talking about the Black Lady of Lark Hall. Ooh. I'm so excited. I'm so pumped. That sounds exciting. Mm -hmm. It's because it is. First question, where's Lark? Resume that'll come up. I'm going to tell you. Oh. Don't you worry. Don't you worry, sir. I've got you covered with the basic information. What's a lady? You wouldn't know. Hmm. So, I've seen this story and this woman called the Black Lady of Broomhill too. So the story goes by two names. And there is a reason for that, which I'm just about to explain. But I'm aware that she has two different names. But the layers in this story are really interesting. I think I've, I've told Kieran this a couple of times sort of teasing the episode to make sure that he'll actually record this with me, that this is kind of an episode of two halves. Mm. There's lots of layers, so I'm excited. I'm going to start this ghost story off the way that a lot of ghost stories start, with a perfectly happy family in a place where nobody expected anything bad to happen. Mm. We're in Lark Hall, which is a small town to the southeast of Glasgow. Okay. It's 14 miles outside. Um, It's in... Lanark, Lanarkshire. Um, I'm assuming South Lanarkshire, but 14 miles outside of Glasgow. And for centuries, there's been a grand house just outside Lark Hall. And for a long time, it's been known as Broomhill or Broomhill House. Hmm. So that's why there's the two names for the story, because it's a black lady of Lark Hall, which is the town. Mm-hmm. But there's a house specifically called Broomhill House, which also features in the story. Interesting. The title to Broomhill was actually created when Mary, the daughter of King James II, married a member of the Hamilton family. And the Hamiltons held a lot of power in this area for years to come, a long, long time. They were one of the big families in Lanarkshire. They were a big deal. Mm. Everybody knew who they were and everybody knew that they were important. Naturally, the house changed a lot over the years. Uh, At one point in the 1500s, it was completely burnt down. And I think I read somewhere that this was in the retaliation for support of Mary, Queen, Queen of Scots. Oh, man. So. An arson attack. Yeah, like a long, and a long history, like 1500s. It was rebuilt, but then this house was left completely to ruin. So that was demolished and then it was built again. And then they extended it and they changed it. And it's had a lot of makeovers and a lot of changes, which which is pretty normal. Like these things tend to happen. Yeah, that's pretty standard for... Anything more than a few hundred years old, yeah. even on purpose or not on purpose. Well, yeah, like a lot of the old castles and buildings that you visit, they, they're more often than not, not the original building, mm. but they've been restored or renovated to look like it was or things like that. It's surprisingly common. It's like my grandfather's axe. I've replaced yeah. the handle three times, I've replaced the heads four times, but it's still my grandfather's axe. Yeah, it's that type of a deal with this. Eventually we get to the 1700s. The Hamiltons still have a lot of power. So we were around the 1500s before, 1700s. The house is big and grand and beautiful. Naturally. And, <laughs> yeah. And then in the 1800s, the McNeil, Hamil- Hamil- the McNeil Hamiltons were the family that owned Broomhill House and the estate surrounding it. So that's the new family name, McNeil Hamilton. Question. What? Is this the same Hamilton that the play is about? play Hamilton? No. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> Just clarifying. Okay. For everyone who had that question. Everyone? Everyone. Everyone who had that question? Yeah, I'm being the audience and so we all had that question. 
I mean, good to know. I'm glad to know they have a representative in the studio. <laughs> I can ask these questions in real time. Otherwise, how would I know? Exactly. I'd just be speaking to the void. Yeah, barreling towards a misunderstanding. Mm. Good call, Karen. Good call. Well, it's in the 1800s that our story starts. Henry McNeil Hamilton is a man that I'll refer to from now on as Henry because his name is very long. Fair. He was born in 1872 and his family owned Broomhill House and the estate. So they were very well off, as you can imagine. His father, William, fought in the Crimean War, which in a very short summary, happened in the 1850s and was when Russia fought against France, the Ottoman Empire, the UK and Sardinia, randomly. Hmm. Excuse me. I'm not sure if... I'm not going into that. Uh, Over the rights of Christian minorities in the Holy Land. And the Holy Land is the area. It includes Israel, Palestine, Western Jordan, Southern Lebanon and Southwestern Syria. It's Mm. considered holy. So that's what the war was about. That's the war that his father fought in. I don't know how interesting that is, but I thought thought you might ask. (laughs) Uh, His father, William, fought in this war and he was very distinguished and he was a really successful soldier. And he had two wives in his lifetime. The first, I couldn't find much information about, but apparently she was a countess from Poland. Oh, uh, who was apparently related to Queen Victoria. And I know that that sounds like a big deal, but it seems like everybody who's an ounce and an aristocrat is related to Queen Victoria. She had a massive family. I, I was about to say that, actually. don't know why I knew that, but I was like, isn't everybody? So, hmm. uh, sadly, though, she died in childbirth. Oh. Uh, but he ended up remarrying a woman called Marianne, but she went by the name Daisy, hmm. from what I could find. And Daisy was Henry's mother. Do you remember we talked oh, about Oh, yeah, yeah. So, William is his father, Daisy is his mother. I got confused. I thought you meant Daisy was his mother and his wife. No. I was about to go, no. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, no, no, no. No, no, no. Daisy was Henry's mum. Gotcha. And William was Henry's dad. Yes. It's not that kind of a story. But okay. <laughs> Unfortunately, William died when Henry was quite young. He was only 11 when his dad died. So he was only 11 when he inherited his father's entire estate. Oh. He was now technically the head of the family oh, because man. he was the eldest son. I, I feel like that would lead you to like how child actors go a bit mental. Yeah, because I, I can imagine his mum kind of like having the reins on him, mm. so to speak, to kind of keep him in line and coach him with what to do and everything, but... Ultimately, having all of that land and all that money is going to turn your head. Yeah, it's going to be a bit, just a bit much. Having all that power that young, I can't even imagine. Mm -hmm. Marcus Aurelius, (laughs) my favourite, inherited, was going to inherit the throne of Rome when he was, I think, like 12. But they decided he, oh yeah, his dad was really ill, or his adopted dad. Like, oh no, you're too young. I'm going to adopt a son who's actually 50 years old. To then be emperor, and then when he dies, then you'll be emperor, which was quite a weird thing to do. He adopted a 50 year old man. Didn't that not work out very well? Didn't he live until he was like 140? Yes, he lived for the next, I can't remember how much, but it was like <laughs> the next 25 years he carried on living. But you, but you know, you're not supposed to do in ancient Rome. No, no, it was quite unheard of. <laughs> Maybe that's what they should have done here. Maybe. Adopted, found a 30 year old man to adopt. <laughs> <laughs> So Henry had a very privileged and lovely upbringing because, you know, someone like that, you don't want for anything. And he got married in 1896 to a woman called Edith Gertrude Thompson Carmichael. Easy for you to say. Well, I don't know why you would be so mean as to call your daughter Edith Gertrude. Edith Gertrude. Because you want her to be a witch. (laughs) But in like a game (laughs) or a fairy tale well her family were also extremely wealthy they owned another estate in the area so when i was saying that the hamiltons or mcneil hamilton why can't i say it the mcneil hamiltons were a big deal so were her family and their wedding was enormous it was a huge affair there's a lot of power plays and stuff going on there, isn't well, there? Well, yeah, because it was a big society wedding. Mm-hmm. A lot of status mm-hmm. to flaunt and gain. Yeah, everyone who was important in the area was there. 
Uh, it was in the local papers. They reported on it in the Glasgow Herald. And this was one thing I read that I just couldn't really wrap my head around. Their guests gave them literal diamonds and gold and jewels as wedding presents. Damn. Diamonds and gold. <laughs> it's really Indian wedding. Hey. Wow. Jeez, huh? I didn't even get you that for our wedding. I know. I missed out. Hard done by. Should have had more guests. <laughs> Who are also wealthy aristocrats. I know. You can't really complain about not getting lots of wedding presents when you have two guests. Yeah, when you elope, it kind of... You can't have both. Yeah, yeah. You, can't you bow out. You bow out. Henry and his wife also honeymooned on the Riviera. Ooh. Which sounds lovely, especially right now. Doesn't it? Just to disappear somewhere sunny for a couple of weeks. That would be super nice. <laughs> well, I was just editing the Burke and Hare episode and it was snowing... Oh, <laughs> that was at the start of April. So things are getting better. True, very true. How do you get to the Riviera in eighteen hundreds? I wonder. You take a very long time. Mm, with <laughs> difficulty. Mm-hmm. You take like two months to honeymoon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that it was after he was married. I couldn't find a specific date, but it makes sense with the rest of the story. After Henry was married, he ended up following his father's footsteps, and he joined the army. Mm. And he joined the Cameronians, which were the only rifle regiment in all the Scottish regiments of infantry. Well, there you go. So they were, you know, they were quite specialist. And he was promoted to the rank of captain. So he did very well. I read in one article that the Cameronians were the ones sent to restore order to the Highlands (laughs) in in the late 1600s after some Jacobite battles. They were the ones that were sent north to sort us all out. That makes sense. If they have guns and you're fighting people who have swords. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know if they were always like a rifle regiment. Oh, that but They makes started sense. off as something different and then kind of changed under the umbrella of the British Army, I think. Mm. It's not hugely important. I just thought it was quite funny. Yeah. Uh, and if you're interested, which you might not be, but I had to check, a captain is above a lieutenant, but below a major in the army. Oh, okay. So there you go. There you go. Because I was curious. I don't. I don't really understand the hierarchy very well. No. But those are terms I've heard before. So okay, I know roughly what that means. So Henry and Edith had four children together. I think it was three daughters and a son. They lived in a huge mansion with sprawling land and lived happily ever after. Yay! I'm so kind of known. Every time a new female character is added to the story, I'm like, are you the lady? Are you the black lady? Who is it? <laughs> well, if you believe that they lived happily ever after, you were wrong. You were very wrong. But, but... <laughs> You're so surprised. <laughs> Something would happen with Henry that meant that he would go from the cream of the crop of Lark Hall society, Lanarkshire society, to only having an 11-word obituary when he died. Oh, no. And being buried in his father's grave... Without having his own name on his headstone. Ooh. Oh, God. So, what happened? We need to go back to Henry's time in the military for the answer. To go to all those atrocities? You'll see. Oh. Henry fought in the Second Boer War, mm. which is also called the Anglo Boer War or the South African War, which was fought between the British Empire. Because remember, it's the late 1800s, so British Empire still exists. And two independent Boer states, the South African Republic and the Orange Free State. Mm. And the war was basically over the influence that the empire had in South Africa. Uh, The Boers were standing up to the empire, telling them that they couldn't build up their army and their forces on their land anymore. And that non-Boer settlers wouldn't have political rights. So they were basically standing up to people who wanted to oppress them Mm -hmm. and tell them how to live their lives in their country and decide for them what was going to happen there, basically. All horrible. Colonisation is a terrible thing. And I feel like I can't tell a story without it coming up somewhere. Well, I think it has to come up. It would be worse to pretend it didn't happen. Oh, no, I just mean that like it's so pervasive oh, yeah. just in history that it, it always happens and it always comes up yeah not that I would avoid it 
just, it's everywhere, man. Yeah. That's <laughs> always terrible. Always. Anyway, Henry fought in the Boer War on the side of the Empire in South Africa. He survived. But when the war ended in 1902, he left South Africa to return home. But he didn't return alone. Uh-uh. Did he take Jon Snow home? Well, do you have any guesses as to who he was coming home with? Um, aside from Jon Snow. <laughs> I was thinking illegitimate child, but maybe just new wife. Mm. Maybe herpes. Hey, <laughs> 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 the joke on RT there. It's not herpes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm going wife or illegitimate child. Captain Henry McNeil Hamilton was returning from war with his mistress. <sighs> So you were close. I was pretty close. Oh. And this is how a woman called Sita Perdine enters our story. Okay. A lot of the information that I found about Sita comes from the work of a researcher and author called Helen Sykes. I think she publishes under the name Helen Moir. M-O-I-R. Moir. She's local to the Lark Hall area and she has a personal connection to this story which I'll discuss later. Okay. But I wanted to credit her at the top because her work has been so useful Mm. and so thorough. She's really good at what she does. I really want to get her book, but it's quite difficult to find. Uh, But a lot of the information about Sita comes from the work that she did. Okay. That's cool. So it seems like Sita came from the Crown Colony in Sri Lanka, which back in the 1800s was called Ceylon. C E Y L O N. C. Oh. Because it was under British rule, mm-hmm. but I'll refer I'll refer to it as Sri Lanka because that's what it's known as now. Mm. And she was born in 1862, which made her about ten years older than Henry, if his birth date is correct, and so's hers, obviously. Mm-hmm. Sykes says that with her having the name Sita, it's pretty likely that she came from a high caste background. Oh, okay. And she was likely a Hindu or came from a Hindu-Buddhist sect in Sri Lanka. And if you don't know, the caste system is what divides Hindus into four different castes uh, or groups based on their position in society Mm -hmm. and it determines their position in society. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's used anymore. From what I could see, there's only small pockets of India where this still happens. I could be wrong. Nepal still has a caste system. Yeah, I don't think... Or parts of it do. Yeah, I think, from what I could tell, it's not as wide-reaching mm-hmm. anymore. But I'm fully aware I could I could have that wrong, because yeah. I, I don't live there. Oh yeah, I don't know in Sri Lanka, but it still exists in the world. Yeah. So Sita was likely from a high caste, which meant she would have had a pretty good life in Sri Lanka. Her family may have had a good home, good jobs, enough money, all that kind of stuff. But Sita ended up in South Africa, where she was working in the mines. Oh, wow. Surprising, isn't it? Yeah. Sykes thinks that something must have happened to... Or something must have led to Sita having a serious fall from grace. Mm -hmm. That meant her family wanted nothing to do with her anymore. That they wanted to make her disappear. So they sent her away. Yeah. And if history tells us anything, this could have been something like a child out of wedlock or sex outside of marriage Mm. or any number of things that don't warrant your family getting rid of you. Exiling you to a foreign country to work in a mine. Yeah. Uh, Sykes even suggests that it could have been because her family couldn't find her a husband Mm. or that she had a husband and he just got fed up with her. Oh, man. Awesome. Awesome. Well, when we were talking about the 200 crimes... In the Birkin Hair episode that lead to death. Yeah, yeah. It's a similar thing, isn't it? It's exile, disappeared because there's no middle ground. Like, no, you did this terrible thing, out, you're gone. That's the thing. Most of the time, it's not a big, terrible thing. Oh, yeah, sorry. You're just like, you've done something that's deemed terrible. Yeah. And there's no discussion. There's just a, uh, this has happened, here's what we do. Because, you know, if that's just her husband getting sick of her, like, she could have just been living her life. 
Yeah. And he decides that he doesn't want her as his wife anymore. Mm. Really bad. Really bad. Apparently it was pretty common for workers from India and Sri Lanka to end up in South Africa. So it's it's not far-fetched to imagine this is what happened. Like it was quite a common route and it was a common place for people to end up. Oh, wow. I think because they were both part of the empire. So oh, actually, yeah, that makes sense. Workers moved mm-hmm. between the two. There was a bigger connection. Mm-hmm. Or like, you know, there were travel routes established and things. Trade and things. After working in the mines, Sita became a camp servant for the British Army. And this is how she ended up meeting Captain Henry. And this is how she ended up becoming his mistress. Oofed. I want to say here that although she was his mistress, it seems that they did have a relationship. There's a big power imbalance between the two of them. So she might not have had much to her name, not much of a future. She'd been sent off by her family. Henry was white. She was a woman of colour. There's a huge power imbalance. So if he had decided that she was going to be his mistress, there's not really a lot she could have done but say yes. Yeah. So I think it's important to bring that up. That mm-hmm. A lot of stories that I read paint her as this homewrecker and mm-hmm. his mistress and it's scandal. But if you look at it like that, there's not really much choice she would have had. No. Especially if she wanted a better life. Well, do you want to stay here and live in this mine by yourself in not your homeland? Or do you want to come to me to also not your homeland, but to live this rich, lavish life of luxury? You know, it, it's, it's a bit of a no-brainer. Really. It's not very fair to say that it was her decision. There's not really much of a decision yeah. there. That's how we got together. <laughs> <laughs> I did hate the mines. <laughs> well, I just thought it was important to bring up. Like I said, in 1902, Henry returns from war. Captain Henry finally coming home, everyone proud of him, war hero, and he brought Sita with him, Hmm. to everyone's surprise. And he kind of played it off. He was saying that Sita had sort of proved herself in South Africa. They had worked together Mm -hmm. and she would make a wonderful servant around this massive house that they had and that she would be a good nanny to their children. (laughs) <laughs> Aye, all right. <laughs> yeah. But that's what makes me think that this happened after he was married and mm-hmm. everything. Um so that's that's what happened. She stayed with the family at Broom Hill as a servant for a couple years. And I couldn't find an exact date for how long she was actually there. And I saw differing reports. Some places say that she was really happy with her new life, that she enjoyed being at Broom Hill, she liked the local community. She was much happier here than she was back in South Africa. And then other reports say that she was desperately unhappy. Mm. There's both. And there's not really any way to know. No way to validate either. No. She definitely stood out in the local community because she was Sri Lankan and pretty much everyone else is white. So (laughs) she stood out and she hadn't grown up with the customs of Scotland and Lark Hall. Mm -hmm. She was Sri Lankan. So life was different there and she was used to different things and people did things differently. So she had a struggle adjusting to life here. A lot of people said that Henry had, quote, a vicious temper, Mm. unquote. And whenever Sita would go out into Lark Hall or try to assimilate, as you would, uh, she embarrassed him. She just couldn't blend in. Not that she should have, but she couldn't just be like everyone else. And that seems to be what he wanted and it made him angry with her. Eventually, Henry would tell her that she wasn't allowed to leave Broom Hill at all. Uh, she had to stay in the house or she had to stay in the grounds surrounding the house if she wanted to go outside. And it was sort of during this time after she was told this that people saw her walking around the woods around the house oh. and down by like, a river, I think, that was in the mm-hmm. grounds. Just getting exercise and walking. enjoying the air. Yeah. You know, enjoying the little freedoms she has. But you know, I can understand why there's reports that she enjoyed her life here and was unhappy because I'm sure it was a nice place to be. Yeah. But she has no freedom anymore. Her whole life is being dictated to her mm-hmm. by someone who doesn't seem to value her very much. If he's still with his wife. No. You know. Then, just a human experience. You might have just caught her on a really good day when she was in a really good mood. Yeah. And other days, she was yeah. having an awful day. Very true. Do you know what's weird? What? There they are. They're sitting in their Lark Hall home, 
hoping that their husband's father, brother, is okay out at war. But then their minds get taken away because they've read about the disappearances of Flannan Isle Lighthouse. Because that was two years before he came home. Oh, I thought you were plugging our other episode. I didn't realise no. that you were making a point. <laughs> no, like, like, it's just quite weird. I mean, I am plugging our first episode, Flan Isle Lighthouse. It was, it was the third episode. The uh, third episode, getting confused. But that was in 1900s. Yeah, I guess. It You're swept, totally right. It swept the nations. It was in all the newspapers. Everyone was talking wow. about it. Wow. So there they are in their home. So he gets home like, oh, what have I missed? Like, oh, I'm not a lot. Like, oh, there's this really crazy story one around. Ooh. And he's told about the disappearances. Oh, can you imagine? Can you imagine if they were actually reading about... Oh, it's like a it's like a crossover episode. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't read the poem yet. Not yet, no. It's probably for the best. But still. But yeah, if it was in all the papers. And like, if the Glasgow Herald was reporting on their wedding, it means they could have gotten the Glasgow Herald. Wow. You've blown my little mind. Pretty weird, right? Yeah, that is. That's really weird. Kind of cool. Yeah. Unrelated, but fun. Well, I would argue that it's extremely related. (laughs) Everything is related. (laughs) Because I was wondering, oh, would they have sailed past it? But they wouldn't have, because they would have been coming up from the south. Yeah. Well, remember when I said that Helen Sykes has a personal connection to the story? Uh, Yes, I do remember. Well, her granny who was also called Helen, but I'll refer to her as Helen's granny, just to keep things simple. She actually worked at Broomhill as a maid and then as a housekeeper for 70 years. 70 years? Mm -hmm. She started when she was 12 and she left when she was 82. Good grief, that's a long time. Mm -hmm. She worked there almost her whole life. Damn. And she left around the time that the Second World War broke out. Well... Wow. Isn't that crazy? That is wild. I couldn't believe that when I read it. That's so impressive. That is impressive. But, sorry. That means she was there when Burke and Hare were doing the thing. (laughs) (laughs) You don't have to link them all together. (laughs) It's just in my head. (laughs) Well, this is important other than the fact that it's just impressive. Because Helen's granny met Sita. Oh. And remembers her being there. Because remember, Sita's there as a servant as a na- and mm-hmm. as a nanny. She remembers her. She met her. Oh, man. So she was a real person. Yeah. She definitely existed. Someone met her. A couple of years after Sita first arrived, Helen's granny remembers seeing Sita before everyone went to bed one night. About 10 o'clock. 10 p.m. They all had their dinner as they normally did. And then after that, they went to bed. The next day, Helen's granny was doing her work, going about her business, but noticed that Sita had completely gone. Mm. No one had seen her. Eventually, she heard that Sita had been unhappy for a really long time and she had just decided to leave Broomhill. But Helen's granny thought that this was really strange because she knew that the last train left Lark Hall at 9pm. An hour before she remembered seeing Sita the night before. Sita was still at the house at 10pm. That's an important detail. If we assume that she did go to the train station, even though she had missed that train, it's a pretty long walk between Lark Hall Station and Broomhill. And as days passed after she left, no one could remember seeing her going there. No one passed her or saw her at the station No one had seen her walking the distance. Helen's granny even noticed that that morning when she realised Sita was gone, the horses and carriage hadn't been out when Sita had supposedly left. Okay. So nobody had seen her on foot, nobody had seen her at the station, and the horses and carriage hadn't left the house. So she hadn't taken those to get to the station either. From everything she could see, Helen's granny didn't believe that Sita had just left. She thought something far worse had to have happened. Mm. What do you think so far? Sounds like she's about to get murked. Yeah. Although, I mean, if it was after 10pm, I doubt many people were looking outside to see someone walking past. That's true. My only thing with that is nobody saw her at the station. Oh, yeah, because she would have had been there overnight. Yeah, and I feel like you would remember her 
if you had seen her. Yeah. If people knew who she was, As you would remember seeing her. Either the only or one of the only like, Sri Lankan people you'd ever meet. Yeah. Indian people, people of colour. So I get that, that people might not have seen her while she was going mm-hmm. there. But I feel like people would have seen her at the station. Yeah, because you'd, you'd have to buy a ticket. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Like, no machines or anything, so yeah. like conductors are there. Everything's done by mm-hmm. hand. Once more and more people outside of Broomhill House start to notice that Sita's gone and they didn't see her walking the grounds anymore like they used to, rumours started to swirl about Henry. Because people began speculating that Henry had attacked Sita and had killed her. And now she was buried somewhere in the grounds of Broomhill. That's what I'm speculating. Me too. Me too. Yeah, I usually... I feel like I do believe this one and I usually don't put much stock mm. into this kind of story where the only justification for it existing is, oh, some people said it. It's pretty good evidence. <laughs> like, well, you know, like, if a story appears just because people started guessing, mm. you know, there's not much to that. But I feel like there's weight to this one. She can't have just vanished. You know? Yeah. I think it could have happened. That you got murdered. I think so, yeah. yeah I, I think, think it so. could have happened. Because what else happened to her? Unless she, like, accidentally died. Well, that's what I'm like. Oh, maybe she, like, had an accident, but mm. then they'd have a funeral. Or, like, they would at least tell people what happened, I oh, guess. Yeah, they just, oh, yeah, she had an accident. She fell down the stairs. Mm-hmm. Tragic. Everyone's heartbroken. You move on. Yeah. While I was researching, this was really interesting... I read about the same thing happening to another Indian woman hmm. from the Buchanan estate in Cambus Lang. The same thing happened. Colonel Gray Buchanan owned that estate and he was Henry's colonel. Oh. He'd gone to Henry's wedding and one of his daughters was one of Henry's bridesmaids. <laughs> and apparently this woman had travelled to Scotland with Sita on the same boat. They had oh, come no. over together and they were both missing. They had both completely vanished. Ooh. Nobody ever heard from them again. I think you just meant like the same thing had happened that an Indian woman came over as the mistress no, of the no. military man. She, well, I don't know if she was his mistress. I, I have no information on that. But they were both there. They came over together and they both completely disappeared. Oh my God. Well, maybe they made a break for it together. That's the, that's the we were talking about that before. That's the nice theory. Yeah, that's it's what you would hope. Yeah. They were actually in communication and they made this plan together. To both leave. It would be nice, but I feel like this fits with a pattern that it still happens with like women of colour and indigenous women where mm-hmm. they're they're just bigger targets for violence in general. I feel like it's definitely not a coincidence that they both just disappeared and they both weren't white. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. About eight years after Henry returned from war, in 1910, Henry and his wife Edith separated. Hmm. Which was a big deal. Remember, they're an important family. They have a reputation. They have, they have to think about the way that they're viewed. And separating and divorce wasn't really done back then. Remember, early 1900s. So mm-hmm. it was a big deal. They separated. So something drove them apart for good. Something happened. Yeah. And I can't imagine that Edith didn't know what was going on when Sita was at the house. Because, you know, if she's the the lady of a big house like that, she's in charge of a lot. And she knows how the house is run. And she'll have a way of doing things. So for her husband to bring home, like, a new member of staff and then... I I just... I feel like she would know. Yeah. She'd have an idea. Mm -hmm. Suspicions. But... What if it was something worse than just an affair Mm. that made her leave her husband and take her children with her? She took all four kids with her. She left Broomhill and they never came back to the house, ever. Henry carried on living in the house by himself. His family never returned. East. So, kind of luckily, kind of unluckily, he didn't have to do that for very long because Henry died in 1924. Hmm. When he was only 52. So he was pretty young. 
and his death certificate reads premature old age for his cause of death. <laughs> <laughs> Which doesn't give a lot away. <laughs> I know that's it's not a lot to go on, is no. it? Premature old death. Mm-hmm. Old death. Premature old age. Hmm. I feel like I have that. But just now. Premature. Like, like it's not killed me, but I feel like I have that. <laughs> it's all in your mind. Yeah. In that book I read Lifespan. Oh yeah. By Doctor I was, was gonna say, do you know the author? Doctor David someone? I'll put it in the show notes, I'll put a link. <laughs> but he's looking at aging and why we age and the potential of us like living forever but it's it's in science rather than voodoo by saying oh yeah old age doesn't kill you like that's on death certificates certificates but that doesn't like you don't die of old age like you get older and then you get sick and then you die of whatever you're like whatever has made you sick like there's nothing inherently from aging that kills you it was quite interesting so that but for a long time, they didn't know lots of the reasons people died. So it's like, oh, well, you just... That's what happens when you're old. It was old age that did it, rather than whatever many illnesses you might have. Well, see, they're relying on that understanding a lot here. Yeah. Because just... they're just saying it happened to him early. Yeah, it's all old age, but, like, he wasn't old. I'm like, well, then it wasn't <laughs> old age, was it? <laughs> <laughs> he died of age. Old he, age? No, just age. Like he, mid- he aged. <laughs> he died of middle age. <laughs> Over his 50 years, he aged. <laughs> and that's what killed him. He aged, then he died. But he's a bastard anyways, so we'll just say this. <laughs> when people heard about this, they heard that he had died. He died suddenly. Like He wasn't, he didn't have like a long lingering illness or anything. And because he was only 52. Mm. A lot of people began saying that Sita had done it. Oh. They, people who live locally said that they thought Henry was cursed and or haunted by her and she was the reason he died so young. Mm-hmm. But I also read a different theory about his death, which I thought was interesting. So you'll need to tell me what you think, because mm. I think it's quite compelling. We've already established that it's very, 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 very likely that Sita was his mistress, that they were sleeping together. There's no proof, but it's extremely probable. Some people believed that Henry had died of syphilis, which is an STD which can have some really terrible symptoms. And I didn't realise the symptoms were this bad. I had no idea. My only reference is Kenny dies of syphilis in South Park at one point. (laughs) you know why? You can get meningitis. You can have strokes. You can go blind. Oh, fuck. You can have heart problems. All if you have untreated syphilis. I had no idea before I read this theory. So he didn't come home with herpes. He came home with syphilis. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I was right all along <laughs> but like how bad is it that is really bad just in itself I have no idea yeah. but what makes all of that relevant to this theory is that if you have really syphilis because syphilis happens in stages so you can get it treated at different stages of severity and mm-hmm. your recovery is you know kind of based on how early you catch it kind of thing probably not in the 1902 to 1920 well, well we know we know how this works now mm-hmm. we know that you can treat it if you get treat if you get treatment you can have it treated and you're fine mm-hmm. if you have severe untreated syphilis you can sometimes develop dementia symptoms oh wow so that can happen as fits of rage or sudden outbursts mm. that would be premature old age right what if henry developed syphilis because the symptoms and the stages of this disease, they can take months to develop. Mm-hmm. So if Sita was there for like a couple of years, like he could have caught syphilis while they were together. Jeez, oh. He could have caught it from her, maybe. There's a chance. And he gradually became more and more unwell. And therefore, more and more unpredictable and violent. Mm. If he's effectively showing the, like dementia. Yeah. So he may have attacked Sita and killed her. Maybe not being in his rightful mind. Mm -hmm. He could have been forgetful and erratic and strange with his family, who don't know why he's acting that way. So his wife could have seen him as a threat or a danger to her and her children. So that could explain why she left. Yeah. And you would definitely act like a man who was haunted. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was really interesting. I think that could be true. 
Uh, yeah, there's. It seems seems likely. Mm-hmm. It would just. Exp- I guess that's the problem when you have the outcome and you're trying. You come up with a theory and then you're just kind of making it fit. Yeah. But I think there's a lot to it. I think there is a chance that that could be true. Yeah, it seems it could have happened, but there's no way of knowing. Mm-hmm. Because he died of premature aging. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we come to Henry's death. And like I said, it was a bit sad because it was almost as if nobody remembered who he was. Mm. His funeral was attended by almost no one. And there was one car that followed his hearse and that was it. Oh, man. Like, there was nobody there. I don't know how many people were in that. I don't even know if his wife and his kids were there. His obituary in the paper was 11 words, and that was it. Man. And like I said, he was buried in the same grave the same grave as his father, which is quite common. Like, you have a family plot mm-hmm. kind of thing. But the stone only has his father's name on it. It doesn't have Henry's name. So he was completely shunned by everyone he knew by the end. Jeez, oh. So something happened. Yeah. Even, you know, with separating from his wife at a time where that isn't really the done thing. Mm -hmm. If it was... If the only bad thing he had ever done was have an affair and separate from his wife, I would still expect more people to come and pay their respects at the funeral. Yeah. Because that's when you would put a dispute like that to one side to just Mm -hmm. say goodbye. But nobody went. Jeez, oh. You know, all all the big crowds from the massive wedding, Mm -hmm. gone. So something happened. Yeah, something's gone on. I was wondering if he would have been old enough to be called into World War I, which he obviously wasn't. Maybe like early 40s? He died in 1924 and he was 52. So 11 years. 1913? World Uh, War I I started in 1914. Oh, 14. So he... 42. So he probably would have, especially if he's a captain. Well, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Like, maybe not, he wouldn't have been, like, recruited necessarily, but as a captain. Mm -hmm. But if he's not, well, if he's got dementia that's untreated, he wouldn't be fit for it. Well, I think, I can't remember how conscription worked in World War I. Because I don't think conscription was a thing, at least until later in the war. Well, that's true. Maybe he just left. But he may have just been too old. Yeah. Or he just chose not to. I don't know about that one. I'm not sure sure. if... Because I know that you can effectively pay your way out of being conscripted. Mm. If you come from a family with money, you can pay and then you don't have to go. War is expensive. But yeah, if if he had really bad syphilis that maybe he didn't pass, maybe he was allowed to go. You're right. I hadn't even thought of that. He was just... I was just a bit barmy. Yeah, because I just kind of assumed that he was too old. Yeah. But you would think because he was a captain. Well, because you could... That's a lot of, like, older military experience. Mm -hmm. Hmm. That's really interesting. I hadn't entertained that. I should look into conscription in World War I. Yeah. Anyway, after all of that horribleness, Broomhill House laid empty. His family never moved back in. And nobody lived there for a really long time. They employed caretakers to take care of the building, but nobody lived there. Helen's granny was one of the caretakers. So she kept the house while they were gone. Um, And they did, but it was really badly damaged by a fire in 1943. Uh, Before that, the army had been using it during the war. I don't know if it was kind of like a hub or maybe it was a hospital. I, I couldn't see. But in 43, there was this really bad fire and it damaged a huge portion of the building. Wow. And then in 1954, the house and all the land was sold to a somewhat distant relative. Hmm. I think Euphemia Hamilton, I think her name was. Euphemia. Mm-hmm. Ooh. She was she was a distant Hamilton relative. She bought it. But that's not the end of our story. <gasps> There's no ghost yet. The family are gone. Everything bad has happened. But that isn't the end. Is this the second part you were referring to? This is the second half. So you can go get your snack. You can go get your little ice cream for the intermission. (laughs) Have a toilet break. Get ready for the ghosts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, a little safety blanket. Years passed, and as early as the 1950s, so not that long after it burned down, 
locals are in Lark Hall begin seeing strange things around Broomhill House. Mm -hmm. They started catching glimpses of a woman wandering the grounds or looking out from the windows of the old house. They began seeing the black lady. You burped in fright. I know. (laughs) (laughs) Too scary. So in 1954, a woman named Jean McRae Boop, boop. McRae. And this isn't the first time I find a McRae researching a story for the podcast. They crop up everywhere. <laughs> We're McRae's, if you're wondering. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she had met up with some friends at the old Broomhill house, because mm. by now it's it's pretty wrecked. Like, it's, it's not been lived in for a long time, burned down. It's kind of a ruin. There's not mm. much of a house... There's not much of a house left. And they were just having a kind of get-together, like you do when you're sort of a teen, just yeah, hanging fair. out and... You know, you probably shouldn't be there, so you're there anyway, hanging out with your mates. But something had gone wrong. I don't know if Jean had fallen out with her friends, but she was going home. She was leaving early. She was walking around in the dark when she saw a woman standing in front of her, dressed in black. And the woman just looked at her, dead in the eye. And she began pointing at the ground between them. But she wouldn't say anything. Mm. So Jean did what I would do and booked it. (laughs) Ran straight home. But the encounter weighed on her for quite a long time. She went home and I read one version of the story where she spoke to her granny about it. And Mm. her granny kind of told her pretty matter-of-factly, well, you saw a ghost, you have to go back. (laughs) (laughs) Which I just thought, (laughs) chef's kiss, beautiful reaction, love that. Um, So eventually she did. She went back to Broomhill at night and she went back to the spot where she had seen the black lady and the black lady appeared again, just like before. And she was still pointing to the ground at their feet, not moving. Mm. But this time Jean didn't run, she waited. And the black lady lifted her arm really slowly and began pointing to the little hill that was behind Jean. Would you turn around? She turned around to Luke and says she saw 13 ghosts just sitting there watching her. Ooh. Oh no. And then she ran. (laughs) (laughs) No. Too much. I came back. I'm trying to do a good thing. Oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So that was in 54. Chills. So remember Helen Sykes, who I told you about? She's the researcher, author. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Like, she tells the story amazingly better than I ever could. Well, she didn't just decide one day that she was going to look into this because she found it interesting. The reason she started looking into all of this and the stories of the ghost of the Black Lady was because she started having these really weird dreams Ooh. over and over again. And she couldn't get the thought of the black lady out of her head. So she started looking into it just out of that interest. And then it ended up being this huge project that she's found so much information on. Mm-hmm. Which I thought was really cool. That was really cool. Apparently these dreams started kind of fuzzy. Mm-hmm. But, you know, like... um this is going to age me if you're listening to this and you were born after the year 2000. <laughs> but you know on the TV where if you were kind of between channels, mm-hmm. it would like, it wouldn't grey out completely, but it'd be kind of out of focus or you couldn't see. Mm-hmm. That's how she described it. But they got clearer and clearer the more of them she had. Mm. So she could see everything better. And in these dreams, she said she was always standing in a room and she was wearing a blouse and a long black skirt and she was holding a set of keys. And I've kept quite a lot of how she explained it in here because I think she explains it better than I could. So she says, I don't know if you want to turn the lights off because we're into the ghosty part of of the story. Yes, (laughs) I Still quite light outside. What's nice about living so far north is that even when you turn the lights off, it's still like daylight outside at (laughs) 9pm. 
So this is what she says. It's me, but it's not me. It's an older me. There's a beautiful ornate fireplace with a brass fender, a clock and a candlestick. And on each side of the fireplace is a door. Behind me, there's a bay window with green curtains. There's a piano and a fire screen with a red rose on it. And standing on one side is this tall, very good looking woman of colour. On the other side is this man. I've never seen him in my life before. He's very aristocratic looking and has these piercing, piercing eyes. After that, Helen sees a man's hand wearing a gold ring with a black stone. And this hand lifts the candlestick that she saw before and hits the woman with it hard. She falls down and she doesn't move again. Helen sees a sheet passed underneath the woman and she's pulled out of the room on the sheet and she gets taken down, down, down to the cellar at the bottom of the building. And then she would wake up. Creepy. How creepy is that? Uh, Waking up, having had that dream. Well, after having these dreams for a while and starting her research into the story, Helen found a picture that was taken at the opening of the Lark Hall train station, Mm. which was in 1905. So this is after, like, our story, kind of. Mm -hmm. And in the picture, she found the man she had seen in her dream. He was identical. And it was Henry. He was in the picture, and that was who she had seen in her dream. Spooky. So spooky. I read about that when I was doing my research. I was like, oh. But I thought all of this was even creepier when I remembered that her granny, who worked in the house, was called Helen. Well, that's just what I was thinking of. Like standing there with the keys and the, like the old timey clothes, and like, is she just like dreaming that she's her granny? And then, you know, like she worked in the house when Sita was there, so her granny knew her. She was working there. And then what's even creepier is that there's a woman on Helen's husband John's side of the family mm-hmm. who also worked at Broomhill, oh. and her name was also Helen Sykes, who was also married to a man called John. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know how into coincidences you are, but this is stacking up, and it's weird, especially if like she was having these dreams as if she was in the house and she was the person there. Like, yeah. I don't know if I've ever had a dream like that. That's kind of like it's almost like an omen. Yeah. Or like a like I don't know how I feel about it. It weirds me out. It's very meaningful. Mm-hmm. Very meaningful dream. Have you ever had a dream like that? It's Uh, just different and weird. No, definitely not. (laughs) My dreams are pretty standard. Sometimes very boring. Sometimes just a bit weird. We have talked about this before. Where sometimes you dream about just doing the dishes and then you wake up. I'm like, oh man, I'll (laughs) shake. It's a waste of my time. (laughs) Rather just sleep in black. (laughs) Well, I feel like I've had dreams sometimes. I think I've told you about some of them where the dream just feels different. It doesn't feel like a normal dream. It has a different feeling. You have told me about that before. And they feel more real and they're almost more mundane, but I'm having an important conversation with someone and it just feels weird. Mm -hmm. And I wake up and I think it's strange. So I wonder if that's how she felt when she was waking up, just thinking, this is weird. Like Something about that doesn't feel right. Yeah. My only recurring dream I can recall is of this shark that was chasing me over land that I was running away from. Mm. And I'm like running up. Sharknado. And I'm like running upstairs in this house I ran into and it's like jumping up and like chomping away the stairs. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well, to be fair, I've never had a dream like that. Well, I I didn't wake up being like, oh, what does this mean? I'm like, oh man, that was stupid. What's that about? (laughs) I think I might be stressed. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) I can't remember when it was either. It was after watching like James and the Giant Peach. There's that big oh, like... Oh, the rhino. Or no, the, sh- the sharks that eat the... Yeah, yeah, there's the shark with all like... It's like a drill mouth. Yeah. That used to creep me out when I, I was thinking Because I used to get creeped out by the rhino at the start of James and the Giant Peach where it's like running out of the clouds. Oh, yeah. They used that's, to creep me out. That was a creepy film. Mm-hmm. 
It was, wasn't it? Yeah. It's like the witches. James and the Giant Peach and the witches. They're both from Roald Dahl books. But the films are creepy as hell. I never saw the witches one. You know, oh, it's good. Angelica yeah. Houston is the, the grand high witch and she's just, she's perfect. I don't know that. Because she's, well... <laughs> the people listening will know. The people listening will have culture and will have read and seen The Witches with Angelica Houston I've read it. in it. You haven't seen it. Well, <laughs> you should because <laughs> it's very creepy. We could do that at Halloween. We could watch it. That'd be fun. If you can wait that long. I can. We could do that in James and the Giant Peach. <laughs> <laughs> Spooky. Well, we should probably get back to the story, shouldn't we? Maybe. Sorry. That's what the people are. Well, don't apologise. I was talking about it too. Well, but... apologising to the listeners. Oh. I, f- I keep forgetting you're here. <laughs> well, the dream isn't the only experience that Helen believes she's had with the black lady. Hmm. She thinks that she's met her. Dun, dun, dun. Are you excited? I'm excited. Tell me more. I said before, Helen's been doing so much research into the story and the history of the house far better than I could ever manage like, she's the real brains behind this story uh, and a lot of the people who lived locally found out about the work she was doing and they were really interested in it because you know, she was finding out about this spooky story and they wanted to know so she ended up hosting this overnight oh. in the ruins of Broomhill House uh, they were doing it for charity, they were raising money which I thought was such a brilliant idea oh, love that. charity fundraiser just to sort of have a night over spooky place I thought it was great charity fundraiser ghost sleepover yeah it was in the 80s it was a while ago look out for generally spooky events <laughs> it's covid we can't do anything like that we can't even go just the two of us carry on <laughs> uh, so it was her and seven other women and they were like camping at the house overnight I think from what I understand or they were maybe staying up all night I don't know but they were there and they were sort of just like having tea and there was a fire and it seemed like a really fun time. Mm. I would do that. I'm sure they were staying up all night regardless. Trying to sleep yeah. in a spooky <laughs> haunted ruin. You're not going to get much sleep. No. No, that's very true. So they were there, they were enjoying the evening and whenever the sort of the story of the black lady would come up, Helen says that she tried to steer the conversation away from it because hmm. she didn't want the whole night to revolve around that. She mm-hmm. just, I think, it makes sense. I think from the sound of things, she just wanted them to have a good time rather than dwelling on this and it being really scary. And, That's fair. You know, just have a good time. Eventually, one of the women needed the loo. So Helen knew the layout of the ruin better than anybody. So she had her big torch and she led this woman round what used to be the back of the house mm. where there's still a wall standing so you've got a bit more privacy because you are in the woods mm-hmm. the women were all sitting in what used to be the kitchen by the way the kitchen of the house oh okay and um, so she led her out and round and she took her round to where a path runs around the house mm. a path where Sita used to walk to get her exercise when she lived in the house because she wasn't allowed to leave the grounds. And this is where people saw her when she was alive. And this path is actually, is now called the Black Lady's Walk. (laughs) We should definitely do that walk. I know, I really want to go. So this is where she was taking this woman to go for a pee. And I've got a quote from Helen, again, talking about what happened next. Because she just, she describes it better. I think it's creepier hearing it from someone. Mm. So she says... I was holding the light and I heard movement from behind me. I definitely heard movement and I thought at first it was one of the other girls. Then I got this sensation. I could feel this terrible cold and it clung to me and then this heavy, heavy smell of spices. She passed my left side. It was definitely female. I could see her. I felt frightened but not threatened. And very sad. I had this overwhelming sadness. Sheena, the woman who had to go for pee, says, shine the torch in. There's somebody standing beside me. So I shone the torch. The back wall was still standing at the time, like I said. Mm. And there was a shadow in the torch light. Like as if someone's breaking the light. Like the beam. It ambled across the wall like somebody out for a casual walk. 
I was about 38 then, the same age Sita would have been when she came to Scotland. Oh. How creepy is that? That's insanely creepy. Mm-hmm. Just shining the torch and you can see the shadow, but there's nobody there. Yeah. I think, I don't know how she didn't just whip around with the torch. Mm, I know. Like, as soon as she heard a movement, I would immediately just like, what's it? But I guess, it, like, if you're there with, well, there's one person with it, like six other people. And you've taken someone to where you're going for a pee. I, I would assume someone had just followed because they needed yeah. the loo. But even then, I'd whip around with the torch to see them. I guess, yeah. Maybe she did. Maybe. Doesn't say that she didn't. It's so creepy. Super creepy. Along the path where she used to walk. The smell of spices. Mm. Oh my god. <laughs> so Helen and lots of other people have been trying to figure out what is going on at Broomhill. <laughs> Just trying to figure out what the fuck. Yeah, for a long time. <laughs> like several clairvoyants have been to the house. I don't know if you know what a clairvoyant is. Uh, yes, but I don't know if I explain Explain it to me. <laughs> it's basically someone who, like, they can claim, sometimes they claim that they can see into the future or the past. That's the one. But basically they can just pick up on things, they claim, that are outside normal human perception. Mm. That's kind of the loose description. And it comes in, like, various forms of things people say they can do. So they've had lots of clairvoyance out to Broomhill to try and suss out what, what's going on what have people been seeing and they all claim to have found different things so some of them feel this great overbearing evil presence at the Mm -hmm. house others have said that they've gotten messages and that there are multiple bodies buried in the grounds not just like one like Mm -hmm. multiple Um, they say that it's the site of evil ceremonies and rituals that have been performed over the years and that's why there's this presence here uh, there's one that says that an important message has been left by someone mm. and that to find it you need to find the family bible and the message is in there so that was what one clairvoyant said my science brain is just like no i know i that's no. okay that's okay i respect that because i don't know how much i believe either yeah. So immediately, like, oh, well, that's the proof they don't work because you've asked them all to do the same thing and then they've all given a different response. If they're all Science. Giving, if they're all given the same response, they're like, boom, yeah, that's some proof right there that they're just wandering in and saying things. <laughs> that's okay. You're entitled to your opinion. I yeah. respect that. Because well, I, I don't know how much of it I believe either. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's a thing that's happened. Well, that's part of the story. Like, that's the fine. clairvoyance were, were really there. They did go. Yeah, I'm not like, oh, Ailey, me. <laughs> I mean... Not when it's recorded. Yeah. However, there's one person in particular who made it his mission to release Broomhill from whatever is still there. Oh, okay. And we can't talk about the black lady without talking about him. Mm. And I'll let you make up your own mind about what you think of him. We can talk about it a bit at the end because I started thinking one way and now I, th- I don't know. I mean, I'm in for he's a whack job for uh, preconceived <laughs> judging this book by its cover hard. Well, his name is Tom Robertson. Okay, okay. I was hoping you were going to say, like, Darren Brown or something. That would have been funny. <laughs> no, Tom Robertson. Tom Robertson. Mm-hmm. He claims that he first saw the black lady when he was seven. Hmm. Now, he he was born in Lark Hall, or he grew up in Lark Hall, so he's local to there. And that encounter, I'm not exaggerating, regardless of what you believe in, shaped pretty much his entire life. Wow. Tom would eventually get the title of Scotland's Ghost Hunter, or Scotland's only official ghost hunter. I wonder who gave him this title. In quotes. I didn't. That's not me. That's things I found. I wonder if it was him. Uh, Well, he trained under a man called John McGregor, who was apparently trained and mentored by Harry Houdini. Oh, wow. The Harry Houdini. I couldn't find any John McGregor who was trained by Houdini other than Tom saying that he existed and that's who he, like, I, I couldn't find him. Mm. That's all I'm going to say. But apparently he was trained under Harry Houdini. And Tom believes that after meeting the black lady as a child, that gave him the ability to see ghosts and pick up on the supernatural in ways that most people can't. That's what he believes. 
he, I have more quotes. I feel like I'm quite quote heavy in this episode, but I feel like with something that's so personal and subjective as what somebody believes that they saw or what someone believes in, mm-hmm. it's a lot easier to just take their words and kind of decide how we feel about it rather than me trying to explain what he thinks and feels. Yeah, we don't want to misrepresent people by putting yeah. your opinion on their words. Yeah, so... Quotes are fine. More quotes than normal, but just to kind of... I think because mm. it's so personal and subjective, that's what I've gone with. It's also more recent to have quotes. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> so Tom says, All I know is that ever since that encounter with the black lady, I've been given a glimpse into the other side and earthbound spirits have continually stalked me. And in another interview he said, She saw in me an untouched brain, a way out, and she opened something in my mind that day. I'm not the seventh son of a seventh son or anything like that, but since then I've been different. Things happen around me. Put it this way, my pals never allowed me to go camping with them. (laughs) So he's pretty convinced that not only is she real, she's powerful. Yeah. And she did something to him when he met her, when he was seven. I used to imagine going camping with this guy going, oh my god, guys, did you hear that? There's evil spirits like, oh, Tom, we're trying to sleep. (laughs) Jesus. Well, I was just about to ask, what do you think of him so far? Uh, he's not for me, no. but he can he can do him, I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. <laughs> I suppose. He's not just immediately condemned to the loony bin. The loony bin. Don't say the loony bin. Uh, bear with. He talks a bit about encountering frauds in his line of work, actually. Um, <laughs> he, and he said that his mentor, quote set out to investigate supernatural claims and expose fraudsters and scammers. So that was what they were all about. I think he worked with his mentor for a while and that's what they did. That was their job. Um, He goes on to say, I would say only about 5% of the calls we had were genuine ghosts. When people start charging money for contacting the dead, forget it. If you got all those psychics, mediums, crystal swingers, witches and warlocks together in one room, you might just be able to get enough power out of them to blow out a candle. Hmm. They prey on the vulnerable and that's not fair. So there's a lot to unpack there. Well, I like that. That's that's pretty cool. Yeah, he's definitely not holding back. Yeah. Fair play, fair so, play. You know, he, he at least addresses how a lot of people feel. Yeah. Because he says that he feels that way too. But the reason that Tom Robertson is in my mind, synonymous with Broomhill House is actually for a different reason. And it kind of contradicts what he just said, what I just read. Okay. Because Tom visited Broomhill with a TV crew from the BBC in the 1960s. Mm. <laughs> Why do you look like You don't even know what I'm going to say. No. <laughs> <laughs> Go on. He performed the very first televised exorcism. I mean, that'd be pretty useful for him if it worked. Like, I'm, it, it happened. I'm not even just... Oh, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, it was for an old programme called Tonight, and the presenter was a man called Fife Robertson, who wasn't related. Uh, the presenter went with Tom to Broom Hill, and they broadcast him trying to get rid of the black lady. He was performing the exorcism, and they filmed him and talked to him about what he was doing mm. and, and how he felt. And they showed it on TV. Well, there you go. That's pretty weird. Yeah. Tom had, he performed other exorcism in his life and he charged two pounds and ten shillings an hour hmm. for his services. So, you know, pardon me, he was saying you run into problems when people start charging money. He charges money. Well, that's what I was wondering. Like, oh, well, does he do it for free? Like, does he do it for free and he's just an accountant during the week? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe one way to do it. No, he was £2, 10 shillings an hour, but that payment was only due after six months had gone by once he'd performed the exorcism and his clients were satisfied with the results. Fair play. That was when payment was due. I mean, it's a very honourable way to do it. Well, you know, it's a bit more honourable than sort of waving his hands around a bit and then being like, okay, £200. Yeah. Now. Done. And even if it's just the power of the placebo effect... I'm sure he did a lot good for a lot of people. Well, you know, if people believe that he's done something good and he's helped them and then he does... I think he should be paid for that. You know, Mm -hmm. he's brought them some kind of peace. 
Now, it took me so long, but I think I managed to find a link to at least a tiny fragment of what was shown on the BBC. Oh, cool. Of the exorcism. It took me so long. And even then, it's in a Facebook group. So I don't know how I'm going to be able to share it. I'll do my best so that, you know, if you're listening to this, then you can watch what I'm talking about. Uh Um, If you... Find the full clip. If you're listening to this and you're able to do that, please let me know because I am dying to see the full thing, the full segment. Yeah. I just, I couldn't find it anywhere. I could only find part of it from what I could see. But in the clip, you see Tom performing the exorcism. He has a crucifix. He has, I think he has a Bible and he's talking to the presenter. And it's quite strange to see. Like, imagine that just being on TV, not as, like, a drama or fiction Ghosts. (laughs) Ghosts. <laughs> yeah, that is really weird. It's, it's it's on it's on TV. It'd be very powerful to watch at the time, I'm yeah. sure. Well, especially in the sixties. Yeah. I'm surprised that it was allowed. From what I could see, the Tonight program was pretty like light hearted and it wasn't a super intense program. So I think I think they were interviewing him from the perspective of he's someone unusual. Mm. Let's Find out more about this person rather than it being groundbreaking and showing this amazing thing on TV. I don't think that's what it was for. Right, got another weirdo for you. We're off up to Scotland. Kind of, kind of <laughs> yeah. I, I wonder if that's part of it. Just He was a bit different, a bit strange. Yeah. Uh, the exorcism was in the 60s, like I said. Tom's a professional, so, you know, he performed an, ex- performed an exorcism and we're fine and dandy. Hmm. Right? Well, that was 20 years prior to yes. Helen Sykes. Yes, if you are observant and you listened well, Helen Sykes saw the Black Lady in the 80s. So, what happened? Mm. Come on, Tom. Well, according to Tom himself, the exorcism failed. It just kind of pissed her off. <laughs> um, after the filming of the exorcism finished... Tom claims that the cameras that the crew were using froze over, even though it wasn't cold enough Mm. for there to be ice anywhere. They froze over. Worse than that, though, he blames the black lady for the real death of the location director of The Tonight Show, or The Tonight Program, not The Tonight Show, Mm -hmm. Jimmy Fallon, after they filmed The Exorcism at Broomhill. Now, this is a little bit gory, so... If you don't like gore, just skip ahead. It's several seconds. Get a different podcast. <laughs> well, I always like to say, because some people like a scary story, but they don't like gore. Mm-hmm. Uh, so skip ahead from now. The location director of the programme did really die after filming. He was on his way to another location where they were filming a different segment. Um, and he was in a really bad car accident. Ooh. This is This is particularly horrible, so please make sure you're still skipping. He died in this accident, and he died in this accident, and he was found with a fence post impaled in his heart. Christ Almighty! Mm-hmm. Like it was bad. Ooh. Isn't that awful? That is awful. Like oh, like, like I, I I'm okay with gore. Like I don't particularly like it, but it doesn't keep me up at night Mm. but that reading that detail something that actually happened I was just like oh no what if Tom actually thought they were a vampire and he did it (laughs) you know what's interesting is we're going to come back to something very similar to that later but he Tom fully blames the black lady for that accident he thinks that it was her who caused that to happen and there were a couple of other incidents that Tom put down to the black lady Um, A different member of the BBC crew had a brain hemorrhage not long Mm. after they filmed. And Tom himself, he claims that he was permanently disabled by the black lady, actually. He has his own story. Um, Remember, I said Broomhill is basically a ruin. Mm -hmm. It's not really a house anymore. In 1977, uh, or possibly, possibly earlier, I think about 77, a group of people were moving the lintel from the house which I think is like the door frame. Yes. It's a big stone lintel. Oh, yeah. They were moving it from the house to put it inside the Apple Bank Inn, 
which is the local pub. It's really old. It's been there a long time. Um, they were trying to sort of, I guess, like commemorate the house. Yes. Yeah. So they were taking a piece of the house and putting it into the pub mm-hmm. to save it so that it didn't get destroyed. Salvaging it. Sounds yeah, like I, I think it's a really nice idea. Yeah. That's what they were doing. And Tom visited the Apple Bank Inn. And he claimed that this lintel, which it weighed like half a ton, it was heavy, stone, levitated completely on its own and smashed into him. And he broke his back. Ooh. So he he had a genuine injury. He he broke his back. But he believes that this was the black lady because <laughs> she was using her connection to the house, made the lintel fall, broke his back and left him with a permanent disability from then on. Could have always been a pub full of drink and a set of stairs. <laughs> <laughs> it was coming right at me, like, yeah, you just kind of kept falling over and running towards it. Yeah, you froze with fear. But he he really believes that. He genuinely believed that the black lady did this and she did this to get to him. He felt that she was vindictive and she's cruel and really evil, which... It's very different to how a lot of other people have described their encounters with her or mm-hmm. their feelings. Like, a lot of people describe her the way that Helen did, just really, really very sad. Not yeah. evil, just unhappy. Is there any evidence that this lintel, like, collapsed or anything? Did you find anything? I couldn't find much. I wouldn't. And I saw one story from when they were moving the lintel initially. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they did it in stages or like they had taken it to the pub but they hadn't they hadn't put it where it was finally meant to be and they woke up the next day to continue moving it mm-hmm. and the lintel had been thrown like over the road hmm. so it wasn't where they left it it's pretty weird that was that had more witnesses to it because more people came out and found it uh-huh. thrown where it hadn't been as far as Tom's accident I couldn't find anything hmm. I don't know. It's not really news, is it? To well, have been recorded somewhere? Well, no. I know that Tom, he wrote a book about his life. Um, I can't remember the name of it. I'll have it in show notes and things if you're interested in reading that. I, th- I think I am, just to find out more about him as a person. So there might be more information in there, but I couldn't find anything. Mm-hmm. When a property developer wanted to demolish a part of the Lark Hall viaduct a few years ago, uh, which is quite near Broomhill House. Tom actually intervened. Like, he he really feels like the Black Lady is evil. He said, Nothing but terror will come out of this. She is the most evil ghost in Britain. I would strongly advise against anyone getting involved in dismantling this viaduct or buying any property in the area. Well. So, regardless of what's true or what's not, he believes it. Yeah, he is. Fully invested. Mm-hmm. I think that's why, like, the quotes are important in this episode because I can't convey how he feels. Yeah, only he can do that. He genuinely believes that she's a threat. Jeez, huh? Mm-hmm. Tom apparently managed to get a photo of the black lady, which apparently was published in 1990. Could I find it anywhere? No. I don't know where it was published. I can't find it. He said that he took it using a disposable camera. And that's how he got a lot of evidence over his lifetime. He doesn't use digital equipment because he believes it can be manipulated and you can't trust it. So he always uses film or um, like tape that can't be manipulated. So apparently he took this photo on a disposable camera. Again, if you're a super sleuth on the internet and you're able to find this photo, I'd love to see it. I just can't find it. Mm -hmm. He's also claimed that he's taken photos of other ghosts hmm. too. Like this was his life's work. Remember, he was he was a ghost hunter. There's a photo of a monk in France that he claims is a is a ghost. There was no one standing there when he took the photo, and he was really heavily involved in this you know ghost case of these monks who mm-hmm. were burned. It had to do with the Knights Templar, I think. Oh yeah. I can't remember the whole story, but he has... I've seen that photo. I'll I'll have it on Instagram in the show notes. It kind of just looks like a guy standing there. 
Well, that's the trouble, isn't it? Like, yeah. oh, well, you could have took a photo of someone who sat there. Because he also says, like, oh, well, if I, if I was going to stage it, why wouldn't I have him, you know, standing on the ramparts? Why, why would I make it this obvious? Like, obviously, I wouldn't stage it to just look like a guy standing there, but I I don't know that. I, I don't know. That's the trouble, isn't it? I can find it for you later, if you like. Yeah. Uh, he also claims that he got a picture of a vampire in Dumfrieshire. Oh. You remember I said... Yep. So he, he believes that he has seen a vampire, a real okay. one, outside Loch Mabin. Don't know where that is. Uh, Dumfrieshire. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and that really freaked him out when he talked about that in interviews. He's rattled. Oh. Like, it really scared him. He even said in an interview that he lifted an ancient curse at the request of none other than Princess Margaret herself. Oh, wow. At Flores Castle, which I think is where our friend's parents worked. Oh. I believe. Yeah. This this is where it was. <laughs> so there you go. Well, there you go. He also talks in an interview about getting a phone call from Michael Jackson. Wow. The Michael Jackson. <laughs> when his encounter with the vampire came out. Uh-huh. He believes that he got a phone call from him. Tom says, I got the letter in the post. The New Orleans postmark had me intrigued. It was from a Mary Grant who had read the article about the vampire Mm -hmm. and wondered if I could catch the vampire alive. She said that she represented a secret organisation. She sent me other letters over the next few months, but with no address for her, I treated it as a joke. Then in November 2002, I got a call. The person on the other end spoke with an American accent. The voice was effeminate, almost childlike, familiar to me, but I couldn't place it. So the next day, Tom says that he sees the headlines and everything on the TV and the news of that day is Michael Jackson holding his son over the balcony. Oh, yeah. And he says that's when he puts two and two together, that the voice that he heard was Michael Jackson. That's what he thinks. And Tom suggests that Michael Jackson had this whole team together who thought that if he caught the vampire alive, they could take blood from this vampire and that might be the answer to eternal life. Mm-hmm. That was what Tom thought. Obviously, there's no proof. I'm not saying that this is actually real because I don't really know how I feel about <laughs> all that. But this is the kind of guy that he was. Yeah, it's just out there, but hmm. yeah. Hmm. So you know, it, strange territory. Not strictly related to our black lady, but I couldn't not include that because it's just wild. Mm-hmm. Any thoughts on Tom now? Um, pretty unchanged, I think. Bit of a loon. (laughs) (laughs) Well, sorry. I'm going to feel bad if he listens to this. Well... sure he's a nice person. Unfortunately, Tom died in 2019. And I only learned that after I had, like, committed to the research for this episode. And his name kept coming up. I kept finding out more about him. And it was quite late into my research that I discovered that he was dead. And I was quite upset because I was kind of gearing myself up. I was putting my big girl pants on, being like, I should email him. I should see if I can talk to him on the phone about what he's seen and how he feels. That would be really valuable. He's dead. (laughs) You said that when you were doing your research. Not who it was. Yeah. Like, his stories are quite hard to believe. I know that they're very out there. I'm not trying to suggest that they aren't. That you should believe every single thing that he says. Mm -hmm. Because I don't know. I don't think I do. But I read one article... I think it was his obituary, like a local obituary, and it said, even the most cynical journalist who interviewed Tom came away with the impression that this was no con artist or seriously self-deluded man. Tom Robertson was an obviously sincere and dedicated believer in what we call ghosts and never ended his quest to find hard evidence to back his beliefs. Wow. So, you know, I don't know how I feel. I really wish I could have talked to him. I wish we had started the podcast two years ago. Mm Mm-hmm. And I could have spoken to him about what he thought. Yeah. And he's what really makes this a story of two halves with the black lady, Mm -hmm. I feel. That there's the history of what we believe happened and then there's just this phenomenon about the house of just ghosts. It it just seems to be alive. Yeah. Ooh. So it's difficult to say who's, who's right and who's wrong in this. Uh, A man called James Robertson who's another Robertson, but not related to Tom Robertson, (laughs) wrote a book book called Scottish Ghost Stories, 
which I feel like I'm going to have to buy. What's that about? <laughs> I was about to answer. <laughs> oh, it's late. <laughs> gotcha. Oh, James Robertson, he, he was almost annoyed at what Tom had said about how evil the Black Lady was. Mm-hmm. Uh, in the book, he tells a story, and I have no names, I have no anything. He tells a story of this woman who was visiting the house and broke her leg while she was climbing around the ruins. And she was stuck there all night until someone found oh. her. Uh, but when they did, she was in surprisingly good nick. Like, she wasn't too distressed. And she said that she hadn't been alone. That she'd been lying there and she'd been comforted by this really strange, dark lady. Like, she looked after her through the night and hadn't oh. left her. But she'd mm-hmm. vanished when the sun came up. That is creepy. But you don't do that if you're evil, do you? No. It's not your first thought. No. You stand over them cackling if you're evil because you (laughs) broke their leg. (laughs) So, you know, like, I I don't know. I I have a theory about what I think about Mm -hmm. the black lady. And I'll give you a chance to talk about what you think about Mm -hmm. everything Mm because that's only fair. But I have a theory. The other stories of the black lady being kind of kind but just extremely sad generally all come from women hmm. like women have seen her and she seems to have reached out to these women in some way she's comforted them in some way tom robertson was a man mm-hmm. and with the way that he acted he was a man who tried to control her in some way like he tried to make her leave yeah. somewhere she didn't necessarily want this is all assuming she's real i i know i know just suspend that reality. Don't say anything. No, not you. Just <laughs> generally, uh, making her leave somewhere she didn't necessarily want to leave, which could be similar to things that happened with Henry. So, what if the reason that he has such a bad experience, multiple bad experiences, mm-hmm. with her, has something to do with the fact that he's a man, and if this ghost is real and it is Sita. She had some really terrible experiences caused by men. Yep. So maybe that's why mm. there's both. That would make sense. You know? Yeah. It was a theory that I was sort of mulling over as I was doing my research. So I thought I would attach it to the end. Voice it. Mm-hmm. What do you think about the story generally? Well, it's a good story. Yeah. Yeah. 17 coffins, for sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um... Yeah, it's just very sad as these things are. Sad to think of the life this woman had to lead. No matter how you look at it, really. Yeah. Just a bit, a bit rough all round. Well, it seems like she didn't have very many people in her corner. No. I think that's what makes it sad. Just very lonely. Mm-hmm. That's that's what it is. It's a a life of loneliness. Even if she wasn't murdered and she wasn't like. Treated really badly. Well, even if she just left of her own accord, like, how hard must her life have been? Yeah. Moving on from that. And to be in Scotland as a bit of an outcast. Mm Mm-hmm. And not really having anyone. Yeah, just very sad. Well, that is the story of the Black Lady of Lark Hall. Oh. (laughs) <laughs> do you want to go visit Broomhill? Yes. Because I really do. Yes, we should definitely do that. I think I read somewhere that the woman who owns the place now... Oh, I was wondering. Um, She doesn't really have much to do with the house. She sold off a bit of the land, but she, doesn't, she hasn't sold the rest. Mm-hmm. But she's done nothing to any of it. Weird. Apart from fill in the cellars with the concrete. No. Oh. I don't know if that's just like a safety thing to Could stop people, stop people going in, uh-huh. but she filled them in completely and then denied that they ever existed. Oh, that's weird. Mm-hmm. Oh. So I, I, I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that? I don't know. The only thing, the only sort of rational explanation was that people were going in and getting hurt. Yeah. I, and it's her land, so I suppose she'd be liable. She probably would be, yeah. It makes sense to fill them in, but why would you deny it? Yeah, that's why I that's thought the was weird strange. Part. No, there was never any cellars at Broomhill. Yeah, well, no, no, there were. I filled them in because they were dangerous. Yes, yes, there were. Weird. Yeah. 
Who does she bury under there? Dun, dun, dun. What 13 people did she put in the cellar <laughs> and then a case in concrete? No. Oh. oh. That's why oh, she hasn't sold it. Maybe. It's next week's episode. It's <laughs> <laughs> so next week's episode. We make something up entirely. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just like Tom. No. <laughs> I love this story. I loved researching it. I loved finding out about mm. it. I did a proper, a proper deep dive. This week. Spooky. Mm-hmm. Very spooky. Mm-hmm. Ew. <laughs> well, thank you for listening. Thank you. I hope you're not too scared. Go find a blanket. Go get a cup of hot chocolate. No matter how old you are, how hot it is outside. Mm-hmm. Because it will make you feel better. It will. It will help. That's not what I'm going to do, but it will help. <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do? Oh, I don't know. Go watch TV, hang out, dinner, <laughs> something cool and exciting. Make sure you're subscribed to the podcast yes. wherever you listen. Um, it really, really helps. And if you're an Apple Podcast listener, or you just have access to Apple Podcasts and you listen somewhere else, please leave us a rating and a review. That'd be amazing. Because it helps us so, so much. Mm. I, I can't really explain how much because you won't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> But it really, really helps. And we love seeing the reviews that come in. Mm. We've launched now. Yep, it's out there. So we see it. We see everything. Uh, Someone left a really nice review uh, explaining the issue that I was having with the like UIG in Flannan Isle. Because I was confused. I thought it was on Sky. And someone left a review explaining to me that it's on the Western side of Lewis. Yeah, there's a different Ewig. Which I never knew. So, you know, I love reading them and we do see it. Mm -hmm. We really do. So we'd appreciate it if you could do that. And follow the Instagram at Generally Spooky. At Generally Spooky. Follow us there because that's where you'll be kept up to date on everything to do with the podcast. Mm -hmm. Especially when the season's over, which you know, we can think about now because we're on episode 7. Yeah. 10 episodes per season. Three more episodes. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing. We will speak to you next time. See you soon. Bye. <laughs> That's, That's Game, Game of Thrones. Thrones. <laughs> <laughs>